everybody, and welcome to my show. My name is Jason DaCosta, and this is Consistent Preterism. Thank you for joining me today. I don't, I don't go through the exhaustive lengths of finding, um, you know, the the who said this or the when it was or the what page or the what. Right? I'm the quick skim surface guy. All right, I got it. Boom, let's roll with it. That's just me. It's always been that way. Let's face it. I.O. has been around for a long time. Just look at the black Hebrew Israelites. He says, do not go the way of the Gentiles or the foreigners or the nations and do not enter a city of the Samaritans, but rather go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Okay, so something's not right. In other areas, he's commissioning them in the same gospel commission, and he specifically tells them, go to Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth, or land. In other words, go to Judea, Samaria, and the nations. So on one hand, he tells them, don't go to Samaria and the nations, but then on the other hand, he, go, he tells them to go to Samaria and the nations. It shows that the lost sheep of the house of Israel were among amongst the Gentiles and the Samaritans. They were in the nations and they were in the Samaritan kingdom. So he's not telling them to go to the nations to preach to the true foreigners and to preach to the true Samaritans who were not the lost sheep. He's telling them to go to the nations and to go to Samaria to seek the lost sheep of the house of Israel, (laughs) AKA to find the elect in those regions. But Jesus makes a very clear and very distinct statement when he says, I come only for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. He makes it even more clear and more distinct when he says, do not go to the Gentiles and don't go to the Samaritans, but go only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, or but go rather. So he contrasts the lost sheep of the house of Israel to the Gentiles and to the Samaritan. But one thing is for sure, we know that they were out there. We know that they were scattered abroad because Jesus tells them, go to Samaria to seek my elect. So we know they were there somewhere, and we know they were in the nations because Jesus tells them to go to the ends of the land or the ends of the earth, AKA the known land, the known regions, the known nations, and seek out my elect. So anyways, it makes no sense again for Jesus to say to go only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel if indeed his whole focus in this gospel was to gather in all the nations. (laughs) Again, This clashes completely with what he tells them elsewhere to go to Samaria and the ends of the land. You son of a bitch. (laughs) Unless there was a reason why they were going there, and that reason is to gather the elect. So yes, they were going to the foreign nations, they were going to the region of Samaria, but they were going there for a specific reason, and that was to gather the elect, whom, you guessed it, are the lost sheep of the house of Israel that he tells them to go to specifically and preach that the kingdom of heaven is at hand. This story is kind of perfect, right? If you look at it, and I know that, you know, the myth vision guys and whatnot, they would say it's not perfect, there's a lot of contradictions, but that's nonsense. That's just not true. The story is actually rather perfect and and it does kind of blend and fit together pretty nicely. What you just said is one of the most insanely idiotic things I have ever heard. At no point in your rambling, incoherent response, were you even close to anything that could be considered a rational thought? (laughs) Everyone in this room is now dumber for having listened to it. I award you no points, and may God have mercy on your soul. Welcome to Myth Vision Podcast. I had to have fun with the intro there. So, uh, Dr. Carrier, welcome, man. Thanks for having me on again. Thank you. I hope you had a little laugh there. I must say up front, so anyone who's watching this, some of that stuff was taken out of the context in which they were said. However, it is interesting. Like, for example, uh, we've been around for a long time. I O. just look at the black Hebrew Israelites. It's like, whoa, he literally said that. But I kind of jacked it out of the context of what he was talking about. Um, (laughs) He literally does believe that Matthew 10, five through six was Jesus saying, look, go to Samaria. Go to the Gentile areas, but only search for the lost children of God, the lost sheep of the house of Israel in those places. Doesn't the text say don't go to those places? uh, Yes. This is common. Like this is what Christian apologists always do, right? Is try to get the text to say the exact opposite of what it actually says. And you could point out like, like, well, yeah, if, if someone who believed what you believe wrote that text, that's not what they would have, written, would have written. They would have written, like you're basically, you're claiming to be a better writer, a vastly clearer explainer of things than the text that you're claiming is perfect. 
Uh, <laughs> I must I must admit, to be fair, because goodness gracious, we got to be very careful what we say on this episode. It matters. Everything that we say matters because sure. a magnifying glass is going to come after the show. Oh, and, and I'm not engaging anymore. Uh, just so you know, it is going to happen, though. A magnifying oh, yeah. is no. going to happen. And, and that that last the, the, the good clip that you threw in there about the we're all dumber for having heard it. Um, that's how you feel when you engage with them in any sense. And, and that's what happened when I did my blog article for people who are watching this. I'm sure there'll be a link um, <clears throat> where I thoroughly show why they're wrong, basically. And, and they're just worse than wrong. Like they're just bonkers wrong. Um, and then, of course, they threw up thousands and thousands and thousands of words in rebuttal. Like in the comment section, you just see just, just word wall after word wall after word wall. None of it, nothing they said after thousands and thousands of words actually responded to any of the actual arguments I made in the article. Wow. And I kept yeah. telling them like, you still haven't responded to my article. You're just reasserting the things that I refuted. And then they just keep doing it, keep doing it. And this, <clears throat> this is indicative of insanity. Like, I mean, I, and I don't mean this like flippantly or hyperbolically. I mean, this is mental illness, right? This is someone who, when you're presented with evidence, that's very clear against your thesis. And then you write thousands of words in rebuttal and never mention that evidence, never respond to it. And you do this again and again after being told like, why don't you respond to the evidence I presented? And then they give you a word wall. <clears throat> and it's this crazy word wall, It'll just be random non sequiturs, all of these kinds of assertions. It's like Ted Kaczynski's you know, notebook, like it's just <laughs> madness. Um, and uh, at, at that point, you, after a certain point, like you realize like, oh, I'm, I'm having a conversation with a crazy person. This is not, you can't have a sane, rational conversation with this person. So there's no point in continuing. And, wow. and there's aspects of this that are, um, that I run into a lot, right? So like I've, I've run into this kind of mental illness before, flat earthers exhibit it. Um, there's <clears throat> all kinds of different uh, sorts of madnesses, delusions that people defend with these things. And they behave, there's a lot of similar common behaviors. I mean, one is the word wall tactic, throwing up a thousand claims, just assertions. There's no real evidence presented. And then claiming that if you don't debunk every single one of those thousand claims that they've won the argument, right? Like right. It, that's not how logic works at all. Uh, and it, it's this kind of, um, and they do that on purpose. I mean, one is if they can keep you engaged, then they can feel like they, they have a view that's worth taking seriously and it pumps their ego. If you ignore them and you noticed this, you noted this to me before they, they start acting like bullies. They ask like bullies and braggarts and children, they get smarmy and insulting and arrogant um, very immature in like nothing scholarly about them at all. Right. Uh, and, and that, that is also a common sign. That's not just the IO people. It's anyone who has these kinds of conspiracy theory or any kind of like delusional view of the world. <clears throat> when, when there's pushback against that, or when people uh, say like, this is just crazy. I'm not going to engage with you anymore. They become childish like this. And then, and then, insist that they've completely destroyed you with their refutations and so on when there's no logical there's, it's just not the ser series of non sequiturs and circular arguments there's no logical case being made uh, by them for their view and they and the consistent ignoring of the rebuttal right the actual evidence against them so my advice to people is that once you catch people acting this way you should stop engaging altogether and just don't don't be goaded by their behavior their their arrogance and their uh you to everybody else and they'll claim victory and they'll claim that they've been proved right and 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 that you ran away like a coward yada 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 uh no ignore that because that's that's <clears> the <throat> childish reaction to having been refuted and having no response to the refutation let me let me get uh, everybody on track for a second this is a good point yeah. you're bringing up um what we're discussing right now is a theory called Israel only for those who do not know. Uh, I'd like to have you of course, explain what you think it is. And I want you to say, it, and here's why I want you to say it for anyone yeah. who's watching, which Israel only people will see this. Yeah, yeah of course. Um, they're going to make sure that you properly explain what they believe about their theory. Cause you don't understand it. A lot of them will say, um, yeah, that, I will, that, I, in and of itself, that's reasonable. Right. Uh, it, it is. It is. That's part of the Dennett theory or the Dennett model of debate is actually it's a good model to say, like, you, you make a case and then what you should have, what, what the next step that should occur is that your opponent should restate to you what your case is in their own words. And then you can confirm, yes, that's correct. So that you at least know you're talking about the same thing before you proceed. That's a sound procedure. Um, but what they do is different. Uh, they'll nitpick any little weird word you use 
reinterpret it in a way you didn't mean and say you got it all wrong. So they're hyper, they're, it's kind of like, you know, like an abusive partner. Like, like they really like hyper specifically picking on every little thing, trying to find some way to discredit you or let's say like, well, you don't know what you're talking about. Like they're yeah. specifically looking for that. Uh, it's and, weird and because it, it even when it doesn't exist. So. Steven Nelson created a chart, a, a graph with bubbles showing an overlap between Israel and Judah because they have a, a the two house theory. And mm. they're pretty much he goes and actually puts Greek words, which they don't read or understand Greek Correct. at all. Yeah, they and don't they didn't like the chart. Now, only one or two of the people that were actually pretty kind that that do like me were like, hey, that's a really good chart. It gave me the idea uh-huh. that I would like to do it. I just wouldn't put the Greek words there. I put it in English because they don't know Greek. Uh-huh. And um, so we were looking for criticisms and they weren't even willing to like give us a thumbs up and say it was good and that. But uh-huh. then their buddies do it, create a bubble chart, like not nearly as complex and detailed and as beautiful, if you will. And they start thumbs up in it, bro. They have fake accounts. Some of them. Uh, oh, they they create, soft puppet? oh, they hide behind fake accounts. And then when you block yeah, their yeah. one account, they want to still harass you and engage you. So they create another account to pretend they're not that person. Okay, and so then that- that yeah. I didn't know. And that actually, that ticks another box. That is another very typical behavior of people who have this particular delusional disorder uh, and who fixate on some sort of weird belief like this, um, mm-hmm. whether it's flat earthers or IOers, uh, they do the exact same, they engage in the same behavior. And when you see that happen, that's, that's really good evidence. Once you start ticking these boxes and you, you know you're dealing with someone who's not mentally well, who's, who can't have a sane and rational argument with you, uh, and you shouldn't try. Like you, you're not a therapist. You can't like psychologically yeah. fix these people. Like there's nothing yeah. you can do. Uh, all you can do is you can communicate with the sane public and prevent the public from being bamboozled and suckered by them uh, and, and misled by them. So you can you can reeducate. Now, sane people will see will look at both sides and say, oh, oh, okay, uh, yeah, they they don't really have a sound argument, right? So like, like, so same people you can get to and, and there's more of them and they're more important. So that's, you're really writing and, and doing vid- shows like this for the general public to right. not be <laughs> snookered by uh, flat earthers if, if we're doing a flat earther show or in right. this case, we're doing IO. It's the same kind of thing. Well, I want to say also I'm doing this for those who might not be educated enough on knowing proper methodology that are honest seekers and they're kind of swindled yeah, by this exactly. theory. There that's are what I'm some talking about. Those are, those are people who are, not, who are not delusional. They're not lost in the mental illness, um, they're, they, but they can be easily tricked by it. Uh, right. If, if they don't. If they don't, if they don't know these things, right? If they, or if, and, and you know, it's, it can be hard to do. Like, not everybody can read ancient Greek, right? Like, so how do you, how do you fact check these things? How do you know that Ephesians two does not have the word mankind in it, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> Just because one Bible translation put that English word in there, it's not in the text. Uh, but there's, there, how would you know this, right? Like, it, so th- there's, it's important to get some expert perspective on this. Uh, and um, certainly if you if you find, like if you see their argument go, oh wow, that looks, gosh, the way they organize it, it looks pretty convincing. Does that hold up? Then you need to see, you have need to get the advice of an expert. Like, does this really hold up? That's uh, why I hired you. <laughs> sometimes it can, but sometimes these new controversial theories can hold up, um, but this one doesn't. And, and when you start digging in it, like it's so clearly false. Like it's not even, it's not even a Versions of this that would at least fit the evidence, but um, wouldn't be proved thereby, but wouldn't be disproved thereby. But the IO people would not like it because it wouldn't be the exact version of the theory that they want to defend. Yeah, um, which I guess we should get to, right? We should explain yeah, this so, to the audience. So who first, might not know. a few things. A few things. Number one, Jason Acosta, the guy that I just played the recording from. I talk to IOers often, okay, and they're not those guys, but they're guys who follow those guys. Well, mm. a buddy of mine named Rob Shannon. I uh, called him and said, dude, this what he just said about Matthew 10, five through six is literally the most contradictory thing I've ever heard. Has he not heard Jew first, then the then the Greek or Jew first, then the Gentile, right? Like first to the Jew, then to the Gentile. And that's what Matthew's clearly indicating. This is for the Jews. This is the lost sheep of the house of Israel are Jews. And so anyway, he did a video yesterday morning. Now, mind you, I know a little bit of background that isn't portrayed on his video where he was cussing at Rob, like not necessarily cursing him out, maybe, but he's like, you're an idiot. No, what I'm saying is true because he knows this is a foundational text 
This is their go-to text when they argue with Christians for yeah. their theory. And now he's flipped it to saying, okay, I'll admit these are Jews. But before, if you notice the logic, what he's trying to say is the Samaritans and the Gentiles are really also the lost sheep of the house of Israel because they have to have Gentiles be Israelites yeah, so that their specific, theory is true. Let's get specific. Some of them. Right. right? So the, 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 I, the, IO, the IO view is not that every living person happens to be a descendant of an Israelite, which that actually would be a much more plausible theory for them to defend because right. uh, that would be consistent with the evidence, right? Uh, in a way that, it, that uh, I mean, it, Paul didn't believe that. We can prove Paul didn't believe that. Paul did not believe that the Gentiles he was converting were biologically descended from Israelites. So he right. says that explicitly multiple times. So, <laughs> so the IO thesis is completely refuted thereby. But for the audience to, to understand here, let's rewind a little bit. Yeah. The IO, the Israel only, we call it IO for short, their view, um, it, it has a, like many crazy theories, has like a zillion steps uh, in it <clears throat> that often seem disconnected. But, uh, but, the, but the main gist, the main, or the main premise of it is that whenever the New Testament, the whole New Testament, incidentally, this, we'll get to that. That's not, this is not a logical way to read the New Testament. But the whole New Testament, whenever it says that Gentiles are being converted to Christianity, uh, <clears throat> what it means is the only Gentiles who are coming into Christianity are the Gentiles who just happen somehow to be physically, biologically descended from the tribes of Israel that were scattered and lost after in the, in the exile. Yep. Right. So way back in the, you know, when the first temple was destroyed, um, <clears throat> there were 12 tribes of Israel. Only two remained uh, in Judea, the Benjaminites and the Judahites. And those are the ones we call or ones that Iowa is called the Jews. Whenever the word Jew appears, they mean they they think it means only Benjaminites and uh, and Judahites. Um, <clears throat> there's some mask man fallacies going on here, but uh, and then the, the other ten tribes, most people at the time believe that they were gone, they they lost and don't exist anymore. Or if they did, they weren't practicing Jews. Uh, and and there were a few might have believed that there were practicing Jews of those lost tribes somewhere in the exile. Um, but, uh, and we'll get to the distinction between practicing and non-practicing, um, and the, the scholarly use of the word Jew and the IO use of the word Jew don't exactly line up. Uh, but their idea is that, 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 so there's only descendants of Israel get salvation. The new Testament they claim is completely clear on this and no one else gets salvation. Uh, and, and salvation only, uh, is relevant until the destruction of the temple for some reason that's hand wave, hand wave, it's not entirely clear. Um, but uh, when, the, when the temple is destroyed, that ended uh, the whole apocalyptic timetable for God. Uh, there's no, no one's under, no one's subject to the Torah law anymore ever since. Um, if you're descended from an Israelite and still around after that point, you're just screwed. Uh, you weren't part of the elect. Um, and, and there's no, so that's it, it's terminated. So Christians today are essentially heretics who will not get salvation because there's nothing available to them. It all ended in 70 AD. Uh, and it was only descendants of Israelites who even got a chance to get it anyway. Um, and and that's, that's, this is kind of, I might be fudging around the edges of it, but that's roughly the IO thesis, right? Is this, this idea. And it's used as kind of a, a hammer to like beat up Christians and say, oh, yeah. your religion is false. Um, that means so, Jews are also wrong too. So it's not, of course, yeah. They call right. Christians faux Christianity. Yeah. But they don't do as, they might as well be consistent and say they're faux Jews as well. Jews don't know what they're talking about either. Like nobody knows what they're talking about but them. Yeah. It, and this, this gets to, okay, this, this brings us to the, the three things that are wrong with IO and these are the decisive things that are fatal to IO that it can't survive these facts. And the first is what you just noted, like I, as I point out, like in my article, there are 15 million Jews and still around, right? Who believe that they're still subject to the Torah law. Um, there, are, there are a much smaller number who are extremely literal about that, right? You know, the Hasidics and so on, um, who still adhere to, still, they still circumcise, they still follow all the Torah covenant rules and stuff. Um, so in what way are they not under the law? Like, like right? Like the, that's and, and and I think that this is where the the IO crowd doesn't understand history, is that they, they have this contradictory view. So they're thinking that the reason the descendants of Israel are the only ones who need salvation is that they are somehow under the covenant because of some ancestor five, six, seven, eight generations ago was under the covenant, 
Uh, so therefore, somehow they still are as well. And so they're the ones who need salvation. They need salvation from the covenant. Um, this isn't how salvation works back then. It's not the point of salvation. But anyway, uh, that's the second pillar. But the first pillar is this idea that if you were not circumcised, it doesn't matter who you were born to, doesn't matter who your mom was, doesn't matter if you have Jewish heritage or Israelite heritage, does not matter, did not matter. If you weren't circumcised and did not submit to the covenant and were not following Torah, you were not under the law period. So they're lost Israelites don't need salvation. They're not under the law. They didn't submit. They didn't get circumcised. They're not following Torah law. They, so they're not subject to the law. There isn't any logical sense in which being born, especially several generations removed with no circumcision, no submission to the covenant, uh, that would still be subject to it. That, that's illogical. No, no one back then, Jew, Gentile, anyone would have thought that made any sense. Uh, but somehow it, it, this is in the mind of the Israel only movement that somehow they're simultaneously not under the law and under the law. And this contradiction is irreconcilable. Uh, it doesn't make any sense. If the Israelites had stopped circumcising and stopped submitting to the covenant, they weren't under the covenant, no agreement, no agreement. That's it, right? They don't, they're not making an agreement with God. They're not subject to that agreement. At that point, uh, they're and, equivalent. And that's it, right? like, yeah. So that, that, it's <clears throat> this inherent contradiction in Iowa. It doesn't make any sense. There's no reason to save the lost Israelites. They're all they're they're as they're as unneeding of savor, of being saved as non-Israelites, uh, according to the Iowa logic. Um, so that's the first thing. And this idea that the covenant was an agreement you entered into with God. This is fundamental. You have to enter into the agreement. Circumcision was believed fundamental. This is why Paul has to argue so vehemently that somehow you can get an agreement with God without circumcision. He struggles with this. He's really trying to force people to believe it. Uh, Jews are like, I don't know. It just says in the Bible that you got to be circumcised to have an agreement with God, right? Um, and so this, this whole, this, this idea that, that you have to actually join the agreement and there are certain rules and rituals that initiate you into that agreement. Uh, and even Paul, he didn't reject this basic principle. He's selling the same principle. He's just saying there's a new agreement you can enter into so you can get the same deal with God, but with less stuff. Like you it's don't spiritual. have to mutilate <clears throat> your penis. Right, yeah. So it's, it, it, well, literally it's through adoption into Israel. You get adopted and you become basically an honorary Israelite. As, as, you know, in a more spiritually real sense to Paul, but it's still... It's, an, it's not biological Israel. You're not through flesh is not being transformed in Israelite flesh. You don't have to have a descendancy from Israel. You can be adopted in. That, that's, Paul says this repeatedly. But the first problem I want to get to is, is, is this deal that, that if you're not under the covenant, you're not under the covenant. So the whole iothesis crumbles on this premise that the, the, the lost Israelites who weren't under the covenant didn't need salvation. It, the, uh, there's no reason for them to be singled out for salvation uh, and not anyone else. The only thing I could think of them trying to say in response would be <clears throat> the simple fact that, well, there are promises that God says he's going to bring them back, right? That's that's the idea. So now Yahweh is kind of held accountable in their sure. view. Yeah. And, uh, if, yeah. If that were the thesis, right, you could say, well, God promised he would go get their children. Right. But that doesn't fit with the logic that, so the IO thesis depends on this logic that you have to be saved. You need salvation from the law but they're not under the law. So, right. so it would be different if their thesis was, oh yeah, they're not under the law. They don't need to be saved from the law. Uh, but, but God did promise he'd get them, right? He'd, he'd, he'd make good on it, right? That would be a more logical thesis. And this gets us to the second pillar that crumbles mm -hmm. uh, IO, which is that salvation is not salvation from sin. Like, I don't know where they get this. It took me a while to even realize that they didn't understand that salvation was salvation from death. I mean, this is, this is the ent entirety of Judaism and the entirety of even Gentile savior cults. That the, the reason that Christianity became popular is it was, say, it was selling salvation from death. Paul repeatedly says, like, if, if we're not, if we're not going to be resurrected, who cares about sinning? Sin all you want. Eat, be, eat drink, and be merry, he literally says. Uh, it, it's, it's, it, if you're going to die and stay dead, like, there's, sin doesn't mean anything. It doesn't do right. anything to us. Who cares, right? Uh, and so, uh, so for them, salvation from death was fundamental. And even uh, there were sects of Judaism uh, that didn't see it this way. Like the Sadducees, for instance, uh, didn't, they believed in mortality. They, didn't th they believed that salvation was for Israel as a nation, not for individual people, right? So like God made this promise that he would make Israel, literally the physical geographic Israel, a paradise for their future children. And so the Sadducees, their view was that you follow the law to not anger God so that he would make good on the promise to their kids, right? So, so for them, it's salvation for the nation, 
but it's still salvation from death, from death of the nation, right? The death of their, their children's line and stuff like that. It's not personal salvation in the case of the Sadducees. Now, the Pharisees said that the Sadducees are damned <laughs> because they deny resurrection because they believe they're immortal or they believe they're mortal. And so they, they're not going to get saved. God's not going to resurrect them. So the Pharisees and, and the majority of Jewish sects were very apocalyptic and very resurrection cultish. So their, their view was that you would gain salvation in the sense that you personally will rise from the dead and live forever in paradise. Uh, and, and that is the salvation that was crucial. That's you, you follow the Torah to get that deal. The, the Torah law that you subscribe to is to get immortality. It's all for immortality. It's for you to live forever and escape death. Uh, and that's what most of Judaism was about. And certainly what Paul's Judaism was about, Paul and the whole New Testament. And it's all about, we're selling salvation from death. If you want to live forever, here's how you can do it, right? And so there's different books in the, in the New Testament have different ideas about how you can get this salvation. Um, but, uh, but that's fundamental, salvation from death. Even when it says to save you from your sins, all that means is it's your sins that are going to keep you dead. So we have to save you, we have to cleanse you of your sins so that you can be resurrected and live forever. It, it, it's an instrumental, not, an, uh, not a consequence, right? So it's, it's an instrumental means to get the salvation you really want, which is salvation from death. So, so sin is just an instrument that gets in the way of the actual salvation that people want. Now, once you realize that it's salvation from death, that this is all about, the IO thesis doesn't make any sense, right? Uh, because, <laughs> Uh, well, at least it, it, it's, it's uh, if, if they were saying <clears throat> that only, only descendants of Israelites get to live forever in paradise, um, which is kind of what, I guess, what their, their view is. And, and it, it, the God it only depends on a which number of them and it's done. Everybody else is screwed and they're going to die and stay dead forever. Um, that, that would, that's, you know, that would at least make sense. Uh, but it doesn't make sense of what Paul and other things in the New Testament are doing. And like when we saw, you saw in the intro, the contradiction between Matthew and Luke. Luke is promoting a Gentile church. He's saying, hey, let's offer this salvation to everybody. Everybody can get resurrected. Everybody can get join the agreement with God. This new agreement we have that we've, we've given instructions from Jesus. We've got this new agreement we can sell you. And, and, and so Luke is arguing with Matthew. Matthew says only basically literally only practicing Jews get in. So even when Matthew says preach to all nations, um, in the sense he's saying, go get the Judahites and Benjaminites who are out there in the nations, but also he's saying, um, he's including Gentiles only in the sense that if they convert. Uh, and that's why he says not one jot or tittle of the law will go away until everything is ended. Uh, and, and that's like Exodus 12 has a law that says that you can become a Jew or you can become a, a, a Israelite and be saved, join in the salvation agreement with God, join in the, the court Torah covenant. Anybody can do it. You don't have to be de biologically descended from anybody. Uh, and there's tons of examples. We have uh, Philo writes about it. Uh, Josephus writes about it. We have the Talmud, the Mishnah. Um, we have examples in the old Testament of people converting to Judaism um, for this purpose and anybody could do it. So, so Matthew's sect is saying that, well, you have to submit to the old covenant to get the salvation that Jesus offers you. Um, all the other, or not all the other, but many of the other books of the Bible, Luke and Mark in particular, uh, are selling it differently. They're saying you don't have to convert to Judaism. This is Paul's view. You don't have to convert to Judaism. You can spiritually be adopted into Israel and follow sort of a more uh, a vaguer law uh, to get in, to get the deal. And so, so it's all about how do we rescue people from death? And Paul saw it as we can go rescue everybody or everybody God has chosen. Like you've got, there are some people that God has decided he's never going to say, right? So, um, but you see this in Paul, like in, in nine and uh, Romans nine and Romans 11, he's very explicit. He says, these are not, yes, the Gentiles are not biologically descended from Israelites, but you can spiritually be grafted in. You know, if you come from another tree than the Israelite tree, but you can be grafted into that tree. And lost Israelites also, he says, can be grafted back into the same tree they were broken off from. Uh, but he very clearly distinguishes these two groups. The Gentiles who are converting are new people. They're not broken off people who are returning. Uh, and, uh, and so, um, and that's the third pillar. So Romans 9 and Romans 11 are decisive IO killing uh, chapters. When you read them all in context, and I notice IO people will just, they'll quote from those chapters and never mention the verses that I point out uh, where Paul says exactly the opposite of what they're saying repeatedly like in comments. Like they, they just had word wall after word wall after word wall, never addressed the passages that I quote in the exact same chapters that they're quoting 
in Romans 9 and Romans 11 that are very clear, very clear, like unmistakably clear. What they do is they run to the Old Testament context. They use what Hosea literally meant in Hosea's mm. day to mean what Paul meant. And I'm finding yeah. out more and more. It's like they've never heard of Christian apologists uh, taking verses out of context. Right. The entirety of Christianity is built on taking verses out of context. Right. So like, like uh, the virgin birth. That Isaiah passage was not about a virgin birth. It wasn't about the future. It was about a birth in his own day. Um, so that's taken completely out of context to invent a virgin birth. Right. Uh, the Isaiah 52 and 53, that's about Cyrus the Great resurrecting the nation of Israel. Right. It, it was not about a future Messiah, but, but later Jewish sects and Christianity reads it all about, oh, it's a future Messiah. It's talking about a particular individual. It's talking about Jesus reading it out of context, right? So they, 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 almost the entirety, and this was actually a systematic thing in Judaism. It's called Pesher. Mm -hmm. And we have tons of examples from the Dead Sea Scrolls predating Christianity. Was, and uh, the Dead Sea sect is very similar to Christianity in the sense that Christianity clearly grew out of a Dead Sea sect or a Dead Sea-like sect, like so, some sect like that. And they were wild about Pesher where they would take random verses of the, of the Old Testament. <clears throat> it wasn't called the Old Testament then, but the random verses of scripture put them all together and invent a new scripture. It was kind of a hidden message that God was secretly hiding like a cipher inside the Bible. And they would completely change the meaning of all the verses in, in the, from the original context, put them in a new context and re uh, <clears throat> imagine what the text meant, um, which is of course exactly what IO does. Uh, and, uh, and that's how they invented Christianity. Christianity was invented by this, basically reading the whole Bible out of context, inventing a collection of verses that are randomly picked from various places and putting them together and creating a new weird scripture that was never written originally, right? Uh, Christianity is caused by taking verses out of context so through the pastor technique. The whole pastor technique is, is taking verses out of context. Right. It's, it's literally what it is. Um, so, and, and so we for call them, that recontextualization. That Paul always means the same thing that the original verse meant. It's like a weird blindness. It's like, do you right. not know that the entirety of what Paul is doing is taking verses out of context? That's all Christianity did was take verses out of context to create and construct this new religion. Um, so it, it's this kind of naivety and sort of blindness to, to what actually goes on in the construction of uh, religious innovation, particularly in the scriptural history, um, is another example of kind of how they're just not on it uh, in terms of, of understanding how these things happened. Um, so, so you brought up Matthew and we, we've we got, I think it's good to just touch on some example here because I know you're dealing yeah. with pillars and foundation stuff. And I want yeah. those who are watching to understand like what you're doing is actually showing the, the, foundation in which the house is built on but you know i'm all worried about like look at this uh, ornament over yeah. here on the house and right, check right, out yeah, the yeah. the shingle on the roof and the hole in the roof and you're They're, like dude the ground in which this thing's on yeah. is so shaky like i want to start there but i guess one of the things you heard in the intro was um, you guys think it's uh, contradictory or that these books don't line up. It's a perfect story and this is yeah. the thing they say and it yeah. drives me nuts because the more I read, the more I'm like, oh my gosh, how can you not see that Mark, Matthew, and Luke are not on the same page? In fact, right, yeah. Luke's more on page with Mark than yeah. Matthew, but Matthew's correcting Mark. And so, you know, I was going to pull charts up. We don't have time for that. But in Mark, you have the Syrophoenician woman. Yeah. In Matthew, she's now a Canaanite woman. And he adds this whole business about being only from the lost tribes of the house of Israel or the lost sheep of the house of Israel in Matthew. But then Luke does this business and says in the same exact, like people don't realize, I don't think they can, like, I don't know if they know this, but the Iowa specifically that you can parallel the gospels exactly where they locate, you know, each scene. And this scene gets cut almost. The only thing that's there in Luke is, well, now go heal people and cast out demons and that they skip the whole business about the lost sheep. They skip the whole racism tendencies of like, or xenophobia, if you will, saying, well, she's a Syro Syrophoenician woman or she's a Canaanite woman or they don't even do that. And so showing that Luke is opening this up universalistically, if you will, if that's even a term I can use to say, hey, it's not limited to Jews in this movement and the Matthew gospel seems to be centrally focused on Jew only till the end of the gospel. When he finally goes now go and baptize in all the nations at the end. And I wonder if that was tacked on or something, but either way, I, I don't know. 
Sorry. Uh, for well, Matthew has the final denouement after the resurrection of Jesus, where Jesus does say, yes, now go for you've done all you can in, in Judea. Now go forth. And that's what I was talking about. Like go forth and get the practicing Jews in other nations. And, you know, to a lesser extent converts. I mean, that they, these are included in the same concept of anybody who will convert to Judaism, anyone who elects to be saved can either convert or already who's already practicing Jew can just join up. Um, so, so it's the same, those are the same group in their mindset. Like anybody who joins, go find them or anybody God has elected to join, go find them. But Matthew means con by converts. He's not talking about go, uh, you know, convert Gentiles without them converting to Judaism that Matthew specifically rewrote Mark. It's important to note that Matthew, it, it, these, these books did not originally have these names, right? They, they were not, they were just called, they were just the gospel. They did not have a name attached to them originally. Uh, the, the names got assigned when they got collected together. Uh, in the mid second century into a sort of proto canon. Um, but, but originally it was just, you had the gospel. When Mark wrote, he just wrote the gospel. Matthew didn't like this gospel or, or the, whoever we're talking about, whoever Matthew was, whoever, right. whoever is, is it later gets named Matthew. Um, that community, the, that was a community of Jewish Christians are like, whoa, we don't like this. This is a pro Pauline uh, view where you can have Gentiles come in without converting to Judaism. No, uh, we're going to, we're going to, Judify this we're going to judaize it uh and so they just rewrote it and then sold it as the gospel they're, they're really they're literally trying to claim that that mark is the forgery and that theirs is the original right so like when you see how matthew transforms mark or adds to mark matthew whoever wrote that is trying to pass their version off as the original gospel uh in in as a way of re, of rebutting and kind of eliminating trying to get rid of mark Mm -hmm. So people will think, oh, this is the fake one and let's take the real one. And then of course, Luke comes along and says, no, 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 you're both right. Here, here's how you, but really, you know, let's, let's show you how they're, how you're both right. And you can both get along. Uh, and, and, you know, so that's how the synoptic sequence goes. And then, so Luke rewrites Matthew and Mark. Now Luke at least admits that he is getting his stuff from previous gospels, meaning Mark and Matthew. Uh, he says that in his preface is like, I, I'm going to tell you how it like it really is. And yeah, I have some sources. I'm using these other gospels. So he's not doing what Matthew did. He's not trying to pass his gospel off as the original true gospel. That's what Matthew was trying to do. He was trying to pull a con on people. But 90% uh, so, of Mark uh, isn't Matthew. 90% or something like there's a high, high number. People don't even realize this. We know this in light of the evidence that the, you can take the gospel of Mark and literally like put it inside Matthew and see Matthew change it. So yeah. when you, when you make a statement that you myth vision guys are really ridiculous for thinking there's contradictions. Um, anyone with eyes can take a, uh, the not even a Matthew. are on eyes. purpose. Yes. Right? So like, <laughs> like Matthew is deliberately contradicting Mark. He, when Matthew originally wrote, they were not in the same, these were conflicting competing sects. So these are warring documents. So when, when, the, when the later <laughs> sect brought, brought them together, they brought them together to try and unify these churches because they knew they could sell what IO does is, oh, we can, we can explain all the contradictions away. It's, there's mystical exegesis. We got it. Don't worry. They make sense. Don't, don't, you know, we, don't worry about it. Um, so like it's that same kind of Christian apologetic tactic. It was a political reason they brought them together to try and unify these churches and get them together against common enemies, which were, for example, the uh, Martianites and, and the Montanists and certain other sects of Christianity. So, the, so, um, so they were unified, but when they were originally written, they were never intended to be in the same book as a coherent collection of texts. They were originally written against each other. Uh, and like John is also written against Luke. There's a lot in John that is deliberately arguing against Luke. John did not like the gospel of Luke. He really didn't. And so he so you, in the, you can see this in the Lazarus story, the way Luke portrays Lazarus as a fictional character in a story that Jesus tells. John converts Lazarus into a real person and his version of the, the history that he created completely repudiates the message of the original Lazarus parable in Luke. So John's Lazarus story is a refutation of Luke's Lazarus parable. Mm. And this is how they're like arguing with each other. Uh, so they were never originally intended to be collected together like this. Uh, um, so to try and like force them to fit. Yeah. That's what the second century Christians, the so-called faux Christians, according to IO, that's what the <laughs> faux Christians thought they could do is take all these contradictory texts together and make up excuses for how they harmonize. Now, sometimes they actually try to physically harmonize them. I don't know if you know how many cases we have where we have actual manuscripts that try to edit Matthew or Luke or whatever, to get them to agree with each other. Um, oh, like wow. we have, we have, we have manuscripts of Matthew 
that take the blood and water scene from John and insert it into Matthew to try and pass it off as originally a Matthean text. Uh, we, have, we have lots of these. There's tons. Of, this is another problem IO forgets is that we have a lot of meddling with the documents. I don't even by, know if they know. They call faux Christians uh, that creates creates problems for for interpreting these things. But um, that's a whole other complicated side story. But if you get to the Syrophoenician woman, this is a good example where they're reading out of context. They're not reading the whole story, and that's. These myths were written for the purpose of you reading the whole story. You cannot take verses out of context. You have to read, because the whole story is the point, right? Like if you, if you take pieces out, you're, you're destroying the author's original message. And when you read the whole story, I got to say the whole story is in that book. Okay. Not the 27 combined canon, the book you're yeah. reading called Matthew, what we call my Matthew, Mark, Luke, that is the story. Don't Correct. run to John to fix Matthew, right. to fix, <laughs> that is what they do every time. Including yeah, yeah. Matthew. That's a Christian apologetic tactic too. Right. right. Um, historians will do that, but they'll do that to try and argue that there's a historical, common historical event behind these myths. Right. They'll admit that they're myths and that the authors are coloring and changing things, but they'll try to find a common thing. But this is not what the IO does. They're not trying to reconstruct some historical original gospel. They're taking everything as literally true and literally intentionally coherent uh, as if all written by the same person uh, for the same purpose, which is how Christian fundamentalists act. It's not how real scholars act. Uh, that, that's not a logical methodology. Um, but, that, but to go back to the Syrophoenician woman, you read the whole story. It's very clear that this is a parable uh, featuring Jesus as the main character uh, about how Jesus must preach to the Jews first, the, the Torah observant Jews who are, faith, who are faithful to God. And then, uh, you know, even though like, oh, everybody's not, Jewish is as bad as dogs or whatever, but it ends with like, well, actually your faith can save you, right? Like it's like, okay, with well, Jews first, because this is basically a parable about Jews first, Gentiles later. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and it's all about like, if you have enough faith, you can be brought into the, the house of Israel. Um, so this is, this is, this parable is sort of a, a myth that is representing Paul's teaching about how you can be brought in through faith, right? Uh, and now, of course, Matthew changes it to like really denigrate Gentiles and say, no, if, if you don't convert, you're not in. It doesn't mm -hmm. say that explicitly, but Matthew altered it to sort of get rid of this Pauline element. And Luke took, came along and put it back in, <laughs> right? Uh, in his own way. So like, if, if you don't understand the history of how these documents were constructed, how they're arguing against each other, how they're using mythology to convey ideas, you're not going to understand the Bible. And, and I think this is the biggest problem with amateur exegesis, like the mm -hmm. IO movement uh, is that they're not taking seriously the skills and tools and knowledge that we've built over hundreds of years about how to correctly understand ancient documents, their history, their, uh, their rhetoric, uh, their structure, the literary meaning of them. Um, they just toss out everything we've learned about how to understand texts and just invent their own wild, crazy methodology to, to get the text to say things they don't say, basically. And, and that's frustrating. That's common, uh, mm -hmm. even among Christian apologists and stuff, but at least sane people who use these methods will acknowledge that these things that I'm saying uh, and, and will say, well, God inspired the text, so my methodology is fine. I get what you're saying about the history stuff, but, you know, God, et cetera. Right. Uh, but the IO people don't say, no, no, God made sure the text was perfect. Uh, and this is all a message from God. And you have to like read between the lines to understand God's message through these prophets that wrote these, this books. I don't see that kind of rhetoric coming from the IO movement generally. No, they see, that's the thing. I want to go ahead and tell everybody while we're this far into the episode, make sure you guys go into the description. You guys check out Dr. Carrier's uh, Patreon. Um, I hired him for a task. Me, well, Mythish and fans and myself contributed to have him spend, uh, you know, precious time and energy to investigate this theory, which usually he wouldn't take up a task like this. But <laughs> I say that to say, if, you know, time is money, and this is a way in which you're going to put your time in it. You know, a man's worth is wages. If there's anything Dr. Price says he believes that the Bible is true, <laughs> is that uh, a man is worth his wages. And I do think it was valuable to have you look into this, especially helping me out. It helped me take serious some of this stuff. But the majority of the IO proponents that I engage call themselves ancient Israel only now. They don't go by IO, they go AIO now. They just changed their name to ancient <laughs> Israel. Um, but right. these guys- Wait, When did they do that, by the way? Uh, recently? A couple weeks, maybe, uh, to a month or so. After my blog? 
Maybe. Uh, I've, I heard him do an episode. Jason DaCosta was talking about a guy who mentioned AIO and they were like, you know what? That sounds good. Let's go with it. So I don't okay. think it has any relation to the blog itself, even yeah. though the blog really got people butthurt and upset. So, yeah, yeah, I understand why they would. But it's just interesting. They would if, if they did that after my blog, that would be funny because uh, one of the points I make is, you know, there's still tons of Israelites around. Uh, so they need to specify, oh yeah, right, right, right. Uh, we just mean ancient Israelites. All the other Israelites are screwed. Fuck them. Uh, yep. right. Is the, is the, the theory of this, but, um, uh, which I call the preterist, their, their pre, the IO preterist nightmare in my blog is like this idea that, that everybody's just doomed. Sorry. So, you know? so it's Sorry, either bra. doom or <laughs> universe. Yeah. So this uh, is important. And- full, full preterism is the foundation. It's one of those yeah. pillars because what you have is when I became a full preterist to give a little context for people, what is that? Well, mm-hmm. all prophecy yeah. was past tense fulfilled in the first century. They said it was going to come soon. Everyone thought it was about to happen. Therefore it did. And as a fundamentalist Christian who believed that Jesus was literally God in the flesh, God can't lie. Jesus said the end was soon that it was coming, that all these things would happen. And therefore, they must have happened or he failed. And I became a Christian full preterist because I was stuck with the dilemma. Do I believe in the church and the consensus of what Christians say? Or do I believe Jesus, his own words, according to the Gospels, and what he said? And I accept that. So what, one of the principal foundations to this is this. Death, if it ended in 70... All right. According to most like 99% full preterist, death is spiritual and not physical. So what they do is they run to Adam and Eve and they say, in the day that you eat thereof, you will surely die. God said, did they die that day? Well, uh, not literally. (laughs) Oh, so guess what? Either you're calling God a liar, Mr. Christian, which you cannot do that. No, no, no. Or... Uh, they spiritually or covenantally died that day and the salvation later on revel- revelation in the new Testament is saving Israel, according to IO, because really Adam to some of them, their cosmology, Adam is Israel. He's a metaphor yeah, for is, Israel, but that's a whole yeah. nother, we don't even have time. How they use their theory as evidence to prove their theory, right? Yes. Like they just, there's no evidence for their theory, but they just say, they overlay their theory on any text and says, oh, well, look, it fits our theory. Like, yeah, if you assume that it fits your theory. Right? What, they, what they do is they use anachronistic uh, principles, right? They see yeah. anachronisms of the law prior to the Mosaic law in Exodus. And they go, well, how did Noah what was clean and unclean? Duh. It's symbolic of later. It's yeah. a recapitulation of Israel's history during exile. That's what they literally say, Adam to yeah. like Abraham. And it's not all of them. But anyway, death yeah. is not literal. So if death's not literal, so, but in your preterism, this is a key point. In in when you were a preterist, you still believed you would be resurrected, right? Like there would still be like you had eternal life coming. Not it, uh not necessarily literally, physically. In fact, right. there's okay. a huge confusion within full preterism because bro, there's so many versions of it. Some people right. literally yeah, believed a literal rapture happened in seven. A literal. Some people literally yeah, believed it already happened. That's what you have to believe, uh, certainly if you're going to be a full preterist, uh, because Paul very clearly says we're going to be sucked into the sky. Of course, he also says we're going to be sucked into the sky and then death will no longer exist in the world. Uh, you know, not just sucked into the sky, but we'll, we'll be transformed into superhuman bodies. So it's basically heaven's gate cult, right? Like we're going to get <laughs> absorbed into these new bodies. I'm not even joking because Paul says that these bodies are waiting for us in heaven. They're up in heaven already waiting, stored bodies waiting for us to go inhabit. Just like the, the heaven's gators thought they thought they had bodies waiting for them in the spaceship that was flying by. And that when they died, they would, their consciousness would get transferred to that other mm-hmm. body. That's what Paul believed essentially uh, is the same thing. But yeah, you would have to believe because Paul very clearly says this is going to happen within my lifetime or near enough. Uh, so, uh, and certainly if you're going to vaguely say like, then you have a non preterist view is like, well, maybe he meant at some point in the future. Right. Um, but even if you've been a preterist predator, one, you have to believe that he meant that all the saved people were, were saved in, well, whenever it was the 60, 70 AD, whatever, they were literally sucked up, transformed into superhumans and sucked into space. And that's it. So right? these <laughs> IOers, these nobody IOers, else gets saved. Yeah. yeah. The IO crowd that we're talking about, they divorce their, they don't ontologically believe this to be true. They actually, Mm -hmm. they divorce the reality of the text and say, it's a myth. It's a story 
but in the story, it actually happened. So they yeah. tr they're doing everything they can to keep yeah. their pr the principle or their proposition true, even if they have to go to complete fiction. So one of the things they say, oh, there's multiple diasporas in the first century, Jewish and uncircumcised pagan Israelite diaspora. Correct. That's, those are the Gentiles. That yeah. There's no evidence. I should point out to the audience, there's no evidence for this. This, right. is, this is the IO <laughs> assumption. But yeah, go on. Yeah, and they'll use stuff like uh, uh, second or fourth Maccabees to try and argue that like some Jews, Israelites, uh, decided, well, uh, I'm at the gymnasium and they're laughing at my penis. So let me put, uh, let me get the reverse circumcision, the uh, epist, epist, how do you call that thing? The epistasia or something? For it, no. <laughs> it's like a big word or something. But anyway, like they're, they're, it's like anything they can. And I think the closest I came to engaging with them on a scholarly argument was Staples, Dr. Jason Staples. Yeah, that's a good point to bring that up because here we have a real scholar, someone who actually freaking knows what they're doing, <laughs> getting a PhD at a major university, supervisor, his dissertation supervisor is Bart Ehrman, none other than, right? Uh, who, who himself uh, was a student of Bruce Metzger. Uh, who was, you know, a, a, one of the world's most, when he was live, the world's most renowned textual critic of the Bible. And, uh, and Bart Ehrman, like his, his forte is textual analysis. And he's as much a master of that as Metzger was like, that's his pedigree. Um, and so, uh, and, and so you, then you have, you know, Staples gets his dissertation done under uh, Bart Ehrman. And he himself has said, like, I didn't find any evidence that Paul thought that Gentiles were physical descendants of Israelites. What I found, and he has an entire massive dissertation that argues at length with proper scholarly methods, properly actual evidence. He doesn't ignore anything. He doesn't take anything out of context. Uh, he shows it like Paul believed that you could be spiritually adopted and become an Israelite. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, and so in, in, in the extent that his dissertation is controversial, it's just this idea that, that Paul thought that you joined Israel when you, when you converted. So you became an Israelite. Uh, I don't think that's that controversial, really. I think that seems obvious what Paul actually thought was going on, right? You would be adopted into the house of Israel. Um, and so, uh, but the point is like, here you have someone who's devoted his entire high level PhD work under a major, you know, prominent expert uh, supervision publishes, he published both in journals, academic peer reviewed journals. He published it. He finished his dissertation, which is as peer reviewed as anything can get. Cause you have an entire committee has to pass your dissertation, uh, through intense criticism. Uh, you go through all of that and what comes out on the other end is not the IO thesis. It's, no. it's the, what I'm talking about, which is, yeah. Uh, so, I mean, um, and that's important to really call attention to these kinds of things that you can see the difference, see the difference between real scholarship and sort of just crazy crank stuff. I have to say uh, on Staples theory, because I'm not sure I'm convinced of any theory at the moment. I'm, I'm very flexible in terms of research and open minded. And I think that's a very good uh, sure. exercise yeah. for any student like me who's an amateur looking into this stuff. But I will say um, it sounds like a logical argument for why church replacement theology did come on the scene, because if he does grant Gentiles entrance by their spiritual conversion without Torah observance, you now know why second century church full of pagans are now saying we are the Israel of God. What yeah. do you mean you're the Israel of God? Well, someone laid the foundation work to this. And what yeah. IO wants you to believe, IO wants you to believe, notice what book I picked up <laughs> the Bible. Okay. Hint, 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 get the book. Yeah. It's down in the description. Um, they want you to believe that the 27 new Testament books were pinned for biological Israelites while pagans who are entering the movement, these texts are being literally developed. So Mr. Joe Pagan and Sally Sue Pagan that are entering this movement, uh, I'm writing an IO book that you worship and follow these texts and the God of this text, but uh, I'm launching this next Wednesday. It'll be published. Uh, it's really excluding you guys, but you're in our movement. That's what they want you to believe. And <laughs> they don't even realize that dating does matter. They don't yeah. get into dating, but well, they don't even yeah. allow this. I mean, they, they, they hand wave it, right? They say, "Oh, well, everything was published before '60 or whatever," right? right. Like they, they, uh, they just, they just. It's another example of using their theory as evidence to prove their theory. It's like because their theory is true, dot dot dot. Therefore, the entire New Testament must have been written before 70 A.D. Dot dot dot. Therefore, because the New Testament was everything was written before 70 A.D., that supports our theory. Yes, <laughs> this is how they argue. Now they didn't ever present any good evidence or much less competent 
uh, arguments for radically redating most of the New Testament. Most of it is clearly post 70 AD. Um, and um, so anyway, yeah, so that, that's the kind of thing that we're talking about. But uh, but yeah, if you're, you're talking about my book, uh, Jesus from Outer Space, which which just came out. Dude, it's um, awesome. One of the things that I, I deal with in there is mythology and how, how if you're going to read the texts of the gospels in particular, uh, you need to look at, you have to look at the gospels being written in the context they were in historically, like they're written in Greek for Greek reading audiences. So what, what, would, what did those audiences believe about the world? What did those audiences, like how would they react to this text? Uh, you can't just anachronistically say, well, I think they would believe everything I think they should believe and so therefore this confirms my theory. And this is why the, the IO thesis doesn't make sense is because you know, if you're writing a text in Greek using the methods that were known at the time, the, the devices, the mythic devices, the literary structural devices and all this stuff, when you look at it through the lens of people who would be reading these books at the time, mm -hmm. They would not get the IO thesis at all. They would get the opposite of the IO thesis, especially by uh, the first and, and that's century. why I think you, you, you know, real expert knowledge has to start from not anachronistic importing our modern ideas onto the ancient text. We have to see the text from the way they would have seen it, uh, and that's where, the, like, I get to the titles. My example of that is Jesus from outer space. The first Christians did believe <laughs> Jesus came from outer space. That is a cool uh, and if title. You, if you don't think that, if you think that sounds crazy. Uh, look at how look at how I argue it uh, and how I use evidence, how I show that that is actually what the first Christians believed. Uh, and you can compare the difference between how that is argued, where you, you take the evidence to prove the theory rather than using the theory to prove the evidence, uh, to make the evidence fit your theory, right? So if you want to see how competent arguments can, can challenge conventional views, that's an example of how to do that. Um, but when you look at Israel only, they, they had to do everything asked backwards and it, it's not the proper way to actually promote a view like this. If you really wanna come up with something that's challenging the consensus like this, you need to be methodologically spot on, right? You need to start with evidence. That evidence needs to build and demonstrate your theory. You have to have a lot of evidence or really strong evidence. Uh, and, and you can't ignore evidence that, that goes against you, um, right? So like th there's, there's a lot of methodological reality here that, that they're missing. Uh, and people who want to see what what that looks like, uh, even in a colloquial text, like Jesus from Outer Space is written for a colloquial audience. It's not the academic version, the peer-reviewed version, which is on the historicity of Jesus, which is mentioned in that book. But even just doing it colloquially for, for a re average everyday audience, there are clear methodological differences between competent argumentation for a view and this sort of wackadoo, incompetent, amateur argumentation. And when you compare them, you really see it becomes very clear. And that, that can help inoculate you against other people trying stunts like this. <clears throat> is, right. is once you know, you can tell the difference between the structure. You don't necessarily need to know how to read Greek. You can look at way, the way they're arguing and say, I can see the structure of this argument. The structure of this argument is backwards. It doesn't make logical sense. Uh, I think anybody could do that. Even an amateur can do that. So you can, if you know what to look for, you can catch these sort of things. And if there's any point where there's a premise, some assertion they're making about a fact, that you're not sure whether it's true, then you can go to an expert and say, okay, they're making this claim. What, what evidence is there for and against that claim? Um, but there's a lot that even average everyday people can do to really spot crazy uh, and tell the difference between that and actual competent uh, consensus challenging. Dr. Carrier, one of the points they'll argue, an example, they take ambiguous text and they they anchor in ambigu ambiguity. They look at John chapter, what is it, seven or nine? I think it's seven, where he says, uh, where will you go? The Pharisees say among themselves, will he go uh, to, the, uh, to the Greek or to the diaspora and teach among the Greeks? Like <laughs> they use that to say, look, they, they start with all of these other things, their presuppositions that build to it and go, well, who needed salvation? Only those who were given the law. Who was given the law? Israel. Well, who's Israel? Biological descendants of Abraham. Okay. So why is he going to go teach and save, if you will, among the Greeks? Who are the Greeks? Well, they must be Israelites. Why? Because God promised back in Hosea that he would scatter the Israelites and one day among the nations, he would bring them back from among yeah. the nations as if they would still be ethnically distinct. So right. anyway, I just wanted to ask you um, your thoughts about that maybe because I, Stephen- has, Notice that that's the key thing, right? You just said there, only, only the Israelite needs salvation. This right. is a fundamental tenet of IO. And this is one of the pillars that crumbles it. Salvation was salvation from death. 
fucking everybody wants salvation from death. That's why Christianity is so popular today, right? Like it's like everybody wants to live forever. That's why they want the text to mean a certain thing. That's why Christians today interpret the text the way they do. They want to live forever. That's what it offers. There's no salvation if you just molder in the grave and are just unconscious and cease to exist, right? After you die. Um, so, and that was true then as much as now, right? So, so the idea that only Israelite needed quote unquote salvation just isn't true. Uh, everybody needs salvation. Everybody needs rescue from death. So that, that pillar just, it's gone, it crumbles. Like that IO cannot rest on that premise. Uh, and that's, that's the key thing, that's, that's, that's one of the three. And then the other is uh, the idea that, that salvation, uh, or no, that they, they always ignore Romans 9 and Romans 11, that where Paul explicitly just lays out explicitly that Gentiles coming in are not native Israelites, that they are, they're joining Israel anew. Uh, they're not biologically descended. Uh, and so they, they always ignore these passages. They'll, they'll quote the chapters, but they'll ignore the verses that say the opposite. Uh, and uh, and so they, you know that, that's, that just destroys it. I mean, Paul outright freaking says the opposite of IO and that's just it, right? Uh, and, and so that's the second one. And, the, and then the third one was um, the, uh, if you're not under the law, right? So their other thing is they're teaching uh, the idea that these Israelites, like you said, are, are they're no longer practicing Jews. They're no longer circumcised. They're no longer following Torah. If they were never under the law, they'd have, they have nothing to be saved from. Even, even in the IO understanding of salvation, where they're saying you need to be saved from the law, but if you're not under the law, you don't need salvation, even according to IO. So there, it's a self-contradicting principle there that, that, that just kills it. So th those are the three pillars that, that yeah. just knock out the Israel only hypothesis. It just doesn't survive those things. And then everything else is just so the, the random crazy of how they like w really weirdly reinterpret verses, take verses out of context, or they somehow strangely think uh, that uh, Luke and Paul uh, are in the exact same historical context saying the exact same things as Hosea. No, <laughs> you know, Hosea is talking about a completely unrelated thing. He doesn't know anything about uh, what's coming up in Paul and Luke and stuff like that. Uh, Paul and Luke are abusing Hosea to like make these arguments uh, uh, for their thing. They're, they're not they're not agreeing with Hosea's agenda or context. They only care, right? They're doing pesher. They're taking verses out of context, claiming that God had secret messages that are not the message. In, they're hidden. The message was hidden in the original context, but there's a secret other meaning. They're taking it as that. And then you know Paul's Paul's whole argument is that when Hosea said that, oh no, he secretly meant. This is what Paul would have said in person if you were to have. That's exactly right. And God secretly meant non-Israelites would come in too. And, and some would say, well, no, no, look. And here's like a rabbi would come. Like, no, no, look, the passage of Hosea says it's going to be, uh, no, it, Israelites that were, that were exiled are going to come back, right? And Israel's, Israelites that left and they're going to rejoin. He says, oh, no, no, that's what the text literally says. But that was to trick the devil. Uh, the, the real meaning is the meaning I'm telling you now, right? That would have been the argument that you'd have Paul with the rabbi over this. Uh, and, uh, and that's just how Christianity originated. That's so you, you find good. lots of examples of this. Carrier, you are 100% right because like I've pointed this out in 1 Corinthians 9. Paul's arguing with the Corinthians and he's saying, you know, what? Only me and Barnabas don't get, uh, what did he say? Uh, he, he, he pretty much is arguing about how the other pillars get to have like uh, they get paid they get for the compensated. They, they right. get uh, they get a per diem, basically. Yes. So like, and he's uh, like, well, uh, right. He's pretty uh, much arguing. Well, oh, we don't want one. But then in the end, he's like, well, I, I don't want it anyways. But uh, really, he's why are you arguing it then if you didn't really want it? But anyway, First yeah. Corinthians nine, he says in quotes, the law, ladies and gentlemen, hear this. He says it is written you shall not muzzle your oxen while it treads or while it's working. Pretty much don't starve your oxen while it's, you know, tilling the ground for you because it's working for you, right? He says, does God care about oxen? No, Paul says. He's talking about us. Yeah. Tell me that's not <laughs> Benny Hinn, guys. That is yeah, the yeah. most like TV preacher stuff I've ever heard right. in the text yeah. of the New Testament. So he is what we call recontextualizing yeah. everything that he's doing in the context of the first century. I talked yeah. to Ophir. Which is not weird. This is what all Christian apologists have done since his day up right. till now, right? Like, so anybody who thinks that this isn't what they're doing, it just hasn't been paying attention to history at all. <laughs> Versus making them mean things that they didn't originally mean. Uh, and if you don't know that, you, you just you just aren't in the game, basically. I wanted to mention, I talked to Adi Ophir and um, 
Rosensfi, I think I'm saying it correct, Rosensfi, uh, the authors of the book Goy. And these are yeah. the leading experts in the field That's right now. Cool. On That'll be a great show. Yeah, it really will. Especially reading their work is amazing. Um, they kind of point like out you get like like real experts like that on obscure subjects that people would never otherwise your audience and people in general would never hear about. Uh, I, that's a great mission. I love that you guys. Thank you. That. Yeah, it's a it's a passion of mine to try and like explore these options. And I got to thank the IO guys for creating the curiosity and kind of the comp competition. You know, it's kind of competitive, <laughs> um, but it is it's it, it makes me go, OK, I need to know this. I need to figure this out. If these things right. come up, like how did everybody get it wrong? But these guys. So, yeah, I, I asked these guys and in their book, we're going to be doing a two part series on this. Um, you see an evolution. And what I think happens often with fundamentalist minded folks is they find a passage that clearly presents like exogamy. OK, for those who don't know, that is not marrying outside of your clan, your tribe, your people. And Ezra and Nehemiah are absolute for the idea of divorcing your foreign wives. So they find these places that are clearly like not cool with foreigners, but Here's what they miss, and this is what's so powerful, and I think you can characterize the mentality of the person that does this. I see a passage, like a Calvinist, you know, uh, predestination. That means everything is non-free will, okay? And that is what I think IO does, is they see a passage that says, Divorce your foreign wives. Oh, look right here. He says uh, the, the goy will be destroyed. Uh, uh, the Gentile, you know, and right. you see these things and then everything gets painted yeah. as one universal message. And you want to put every square peg into a round hole and you don't yeah. realize there's dynamics. There's flu. There's kind of porous fluidity, if you will, through the Bible, like Ezekiel has a universal mindset on Gentile, where Ezra and Nehemiah are very exclusive exclusive and xenophobic and very limiting on their idea of the outsiders. But get this, the Goy book, they go into the most racist text, if you will, if, if I can yeah. use the term, yeah. Ezra and Nehemiah, and point that even they didn't exclude every outsider. They chose what nations they were saying are outsiders, but they didn't mention Persians. Hmm, I wonder. And, and this is, it's important because that's a very specific historical context, a very specific camp of thinking. Uh, that only existed at that moment in time. Like if you go before that, you find, you know, you have Joshua and these other texts are written specifically to promote bringing foreign wives in and integrating them into the sect, right? Like that's with elaborate procedures to like cleanse these women and then bam, you get to marry them as long as they're virgins. Uh, and, uh, and then you have later, you have, you have, or you also have the Exodus conversion rule. And then you have later in the second temple period, which is not so much represented uh, clearly in the Bible necessarily, um, but Ezekiel is actually part of that. Uh, he's not second temple, but he's, he's post exile. But uh, you get later, if you get the, the second temple Jude Jewish text, you see much more openness to that, but you see conflicts, conflicts between sects. Like the Pharisees mm -hmm. were much more hardline about this. And then you had the difference between the Hillelites and the Shamites. So even the Pharisees had arguments with each other over how, how liberal can we be with inducting people? Uh, and, and different other sects were much, much more open-minded about this. And, uh, and, you know, Christianity clearly with Paul came along and made it probably the most open-minded of all of the, uh, Jewish sects at the time. Um, so yeah, you have this, the time, things change over time. Different people have different perspectives. The different books mean different things. Mm -hmm. And then of course they meant different things when they were written. And then yes, Jews were also reinterpreting these texts later in all kinds of wild ways. So when, when Paul comes along and the early Christians come along and they do the same thing, they're doing the same thing that, that was a standard Jewish practice to like completely reinterpret what these things meant. It's not what they meant originally, but they change what they mean uh, through the Pesher technique and others. Um, so that, uh, if you don't understand the history of how these books developed over time, how they were written per, for a particular circumstance, and like Ezra, for example, is written in a particular circumstance of actually resentment towards the, the, the ones, the people who didn't leave, like who stayed and intermarried. Mm -hmm. And so it created this kind of like the Samaritans, basically created this sort of intermixed version of Judaism slash paganism. And so like his camp, and he's probably not the only, they're probably camps against Ezra. We don't get to read all of the different Jewish perspectives at the time. Uh, and so, so he has this particular perspective at the particular time because of Cyrus and the way things transformed and what was going on at that moment and then history and so on. Uh, and that resentment just sort of didn't exist two, three, 400 years later, uh, right? So it's like, there's a different attitude 
changes the way people read the text, changes the way people use the text and so on. Um, so, so yeah, his, history, you have to attend a historical fact to understand texts. You can't take them out of their historical context uh, and, and take them and pretend that they're all written by the same author with the same views. Like that, that's just not the correct way to analyze the Bible. And for anybody who's interested in this, I really, really suggest you read more. Don't just take the word of someone on YouTube, even this channel, okay, who sounds like a t like a preacher, all right? They really have a, one hell of a, they can speak. Jason DaCosta knows how to talk. I mean, that guy, he's a, he's a salesman. He sells PPE for a living, okay? You can tell. Yeah. yeah, you can tell he's very well articulate and he he knows how to put the right kind of funny and the right kind of, you know, uh, emotion into it to get his audience to go, oh, that makes sense. Bing, bing, bing. It's all they know. Keep reading, because if you keep reading, you'll find out real soon that it's like going to your local Baptist church. OK, you're going to find that they have a mission and an agenda. And I think he does. I personally do think that most of the I.O. people that I talk to, not all are Israel only proponents, because if they found out that Israel only wasn't true, they almost feel like they're duped and they need to become a Christian again. Like they feel like, well, if we, if that's meant for anyone outside of Israelites, that means I might have to play a role in this thing. Who said that? Who said you need to be a Christian? And I feel that way. I'm maybe I'm straw man. And, and I want to set it up front. Don't take well, what I'm saying I mean, here. There's a similar thing with uh, the historicity versus resurrection debate, right? Like there's, there's a lot of Christians, not, I'm sorry, a lot of ex Christians will go around trying to beat Christians over the head with the mythicism stuff and say like, Oh, look, it's, it's obvious that Jesus didn't exist. So your whole religion is bogus. Uh, and there are even some people who've left Christianity because of realizing that it actually makes sense that there wasn't a Jesus. Right. So the mythicism right. has even deconverted some people. But you don't need, so there's two problems with that. One is like, we can way more securely prove that Jesus wasn't risen from the dead than we can prove Jesus didn't exist, right? right. So like, like, so you don't have, you don't need mythos, mythicist theories to leave Christianity. It's obvious Christianity is false, even if Jesus existed. So don't get obsessed with mythicism, right? And don't use it as a cudgel, to like beat up Christians, because it's a lot less certain than a much more obvious apologetic, which is like the resurrection is ridiculous. It obviously right. didn't happen. Uh, so you have a much stronger argument just taking, just saying, let's, let's just assume Jesus existed. The resurrection is bogus, right? And so, and you can, there's a lot of other evidence you can talk about, uh, you know, what I do in my book, uh, why I'm not a Christian. I have four chapters, four arguments as to why uh, Christianity is not a true religion. None of them involve assuming that Jesus didn't exist. Uh, so you don't need Jesus mythicism to leave Christianity. So if, if you like have doubts about, well, maybe Jesus did exist historically, that doesn't mean that, oh, well, now I have to be a Christian again. It's like, no, no, the rest of the religion it still isn't true, right? Like th the fact that Jesus existed would be no more meaningful than that Joseph Smith existed or Muhammad existed. That doesn't mean Islam is true or that, uh, you know, Mormonism <laughs> is true. Um, so, uh, so I think that this sort of confusion between like, you really adamantly feel betrayed by being told that Jesus existed and then you find the mythicist argument convincing and so you leave Christianity over it. If you, if you tie your, uh, your apostasy to that, that moment, you might not be able to step back and say, oh, actually I have plenty of reasons to not be a Christian. I don't really need to like hang on to this mythicism thing. I mean, if I do, you, sh you should just do it based on the evidence and not, and not as a, like an anchor to keep you out of the faith or to uh, cudgel Christians with, right? So right. I think you have the same thing that you're running into here with IO people. That, that if IO ever convinced anybody to get out of Christianity, which I, I can't be too many people in the world that that's true of, but, uh, but, but even if that happened, uh, all that really does like pull the scales off your eyes so that now you can see that actually, okay, even though IO isn't true, there's plenty of other stuff that's not true. So like, right. I, there's no reason to go back to Christianity. You got to look forward. Basically. That's why I said, I hope I'm not strawmanning anyone, but Dr. Carrier, like, I love this because really what this does is it, it's going to make anyone watching, I feel, uh, need to really check everything that they are saying to really reconsider and at least build their evidence to make their case. I know for a fact some of these IOers are going to yeah. uh, only do everything they can to prove their point and to prove you wrong. That's literally their I, whole agenda. I want to, I want to throw a warning. In them. So here, here's what they'll do. They'll, they'll throw up like a 45 or 80 page treatise thing. This refutes them. No TLDR. No one's going to read a 45 page treatise. So, so people will, will say like, wow, there must be something there because they've got 45 pages of refutation. What you should do is just do like the first two pages and so it, it, has any of the arguments they've given 
Did they present any evidence for their assertions? Uh, and does their conclusion even follow from the premises? And once you once you find the answer is no, for two whole pages, you know you don't need to waste time continuing, right? Yeah. Like, and so so don't don't take the word wall. Don't fall for the word wall tactic. This is a tactic they use. They throw up so many words that it's impossible to read them all. So you can't examine every single claim they make because they make thousands and thousands of claims. Oh yeah. What you need to know is be like, are the claims they're making based on a methodology generally that actually is even sound? Uh, and you know, is, is just their, like I said, do their conclusions follow from a premise? Uh, and then they're only occasionally like they might make some fact claim uh, that you say, well, that if that fact is true, that would support their thesis. That's when you need to like fact check them. Like, is their factual claim correct? Uh, and usually the answer in that case will be no. Like there's only two kinds of facts that they ever cite, facts that aren't true and facts that don't entail their thesis, right? So <laughs> yeah. And so anybody can identify these things. So, so don't be snowed by the word wall tactic. Don't be snowed by their rhetoric. Uh, do an honest look at, uh, is this, you know, do it like a sample of their work and say like, are they even arguing in a way that's worth my time? Uh, and, and I say like, like just, just do a sample and see if any of this makes sense. And if not, just, you, don't, you know you don't need to waste time on any more of their baloney. They'll keep throwing, they'll, if you don't read their 45 page treatise, they'll throw you an 80 page treatise. If you don't read their 80 page treatise, they'll throw you a five hour video, right? So it's like, they're, like they're, they're trying to bury you in claims and claims and claims and assertions and hoping you just give up and, and, and are overwhelmed by the number of things. Don't fall for that tactic. There, there are tra strategies to ascertain whether these are people you should even be listening to or not. And then just need to sample it. And then, just, then you can just walk away and don't let them goad you into uh, continuing to interact with their crazy, basically. A couple things, and then I'll pass the mic to you just to get it out while I'm on this video, because I, guess, I think it's important that I say it. Um, I equated their some of their information from the Black Hebrew Israelite and the Christian Identity British Israelitism uh, groups, because they do borrow this concept of Gentiles and Paul being actual Israelites from these groups. Now, mm -hmm. I'm not saying they claim to be Israel. Everyone knows that I know what I was saying. Okay, so uh, I had obviously uh, been, I guess you'd say poisoned. The well has been poisoned on me for <laughs> saying that, which isn't true. I never said that. I did say that they do use some of their stuff. Number two, um, what they do, and you're right, they use a thousand different things to build their case. So I wanted to bring up um, James chapter one, to the scattered 12 abroad, right? They'll use this as like a, hey, to the 12 tribes scattered abroad, evidence that they're scattered out here and therefore they don't think and, and I'm not saying this is the accurate understanding. I'm saying this is so ambiguous, though, to make a doctrine from. Yeah. So here, you know, here's a good example. This is a really good example. So if you read the whole, read the whole letter of James, don't just read line one, read the whole letter. Uh, and, and if you don't have time to read the whole letter, uh, I, if you go to my article, I have links to the passages that matter to what I'm about to say, if you want to skip right to them. But James is clearly written to practicing Jews, not non-circumcised, you know, uh, apostates who are now pagans or polytheists or whatever. No, he's, he's writing to people who are already Torah observant and already agree that you have to be Torah observant to be saved. And there's two passages in James, and I link to them in my article, where he's, it's very clear he just assumes that his audience is Torah observant and agrees he should be Torah observant. He doesn't make an argument for them or try to argue them into Torah observance. No, he, he does just, bash Paul clearly. though. Yeah, so he's clearly talking to practicing uh, or well, practicing Jews, but it, I will hate that word, but uh, uh, people practicing Judaism. So regardless of whether James thinks that some of these diaspora Jews are uh, not Judahites or Benjaminites, maybe they're one of the other 10 tribes. He might have believed that. I, I don't know. Like, there's lots of different ways to interpret what he means by to the 12 tribes in the diaspora. Um, but uh, it might just be a hopeful expression that maybe there are some lost tribes out there. But, but even if he's including other tribes, other 10 tribes of the lost tribes, he still means the ones who've remained faithful, who are actually mm -hmm. still Torah observant Jews. Like it's very clear that James has written for that. The, the IO crowd will just ignore this. They'll, they'll just keep, keep quoting James 1, James 1. And I'll point out those other verses that show that he's, he's talking about Torah, already Torah observant people. He's they not ignore it. About the people you're talking about. And they'll just ignore it. They won't respond to it. They'll just keep assert, making their assertion, making their assertion, ignoring the evidence against them. Uh, or just, or they'll come up with some blather about like how to dismiss the evidence that isn't logical. Uh, and once you see them do that, you know you can't trust these people uh, as exegetes of the Bible. 
Makes perfect sense. And I'm with you 100%. I do like the idea of the hopefulness because Josephus had the same kind of hopefulness for the Lost Tribes. Also, um, Jason Staples takes kind of a different angle where he says, you know, it's like a spiritual uh, replacement. So so in a sense, there's this idea that the hopefulness, it, it is eschatological, or at least the New Testament is packaged in this uh the end is near idea. And so there could be a hopefulness there, even though that may not be the case. It might just be the 12 tribes being Jewish diaspora. So there you answer right. it. Yeah, it might um, just be a metonymy or synecdoche for the diaspora. Sure. Interesting. Yeah. And that's the Jewish diaspora, which are the Jews, which t- separating the two house idea here is what they want to force in the debate. Yeah. And there's not evidence there's, supporting that. Right. There's no that. evidence to, to read it that way. Is the point. And the mere fact that the verse exists does not automatically justify their interpretation of the verse. Right. So uh, that's what they'll do. They'll start with their theory. They'll interpret the verse according to their theory and say, see, proves our theory. It's like, no, you just argued in a circle. You didn't go anywhere. You just you just assume asserted that your interpretation of that verse is correct. The evidence in James entails that it isn't correct. Like we, we it's not even like it's not even as if those verses weren't in James. And so we didn't know. We couldn't tell because James could mean multiple things. We don't know. No, we know James is talking about Torah observant. <laughs> Judaites, Benjaminites, maybe other tribes, we don't know. But he means Torah, already Torah observant people, not, not what the IO people are talking about, these sort of you know uncircumcised, polytheistic descendants of Israelites. Yeah, or even, uh, I don't even know, th- th- that's the complication here because they didn't even know their God in Acts 17 if these are supposedly Israelites. They don't even know the name of the God that they're worshiping, which is an unknown God. And you brought that, that up in your article, yeah. which was fascinating about him quoting a pagan poet. It's like from one man, oh, yeah. all yeah, the nations. The <laughs> That's oh, another my. example of how people don't understand. The, well, first of all, Paul didn't say any of those things. This is Acts. This is a right. fictional speech that, that the author of Acts is inventing <laughs> and putting in Paul's mind. Paul's mouth. So uh, first of all, that's problem number one. But problem number two is that he's literally crafting this as a message. He's, it's intended for his audience, Luke's audience, which is predominantly Gentiles, meaning non-Israelites. Sorry, IO people. Um, but he's having, he gives Paul this speech where he says uh, that all the nations, including, you know, non-Israelites, it's very clear that he means uh, it, it, there's these allusions to the to Genesis uh, and, uh, and Exodus. There's allusions to the Old Testament. Deuteronomy and, and, and Genesis that, that where he, he's very in, in clearly implying from a Jewish perspective, everybody gets in. Uh, but also he's, he's quoting uh, uh, Stoic philosophers. He's actually echoing Stoic philosophy that also had the same doctrine that everybody was the son of God. We all have a common humanity. Everybody all have a common humanity. He's echoing the exact same thing. And he's, Luke has Paul do this in the Areopagus <laughs> right where the freaking Stoa are after whom the Stoa Stoics are named. Cause that's where the Stoics taught was at the Stoa right where Paul is speaking in this. And so if you don't, if you don't know any of this stuff, you won't understand what Luke is doing in this chapter. And that's the difference between like expert knowledge and amateurs, like just going at the text and not just completely blind to what Luke meant, what, what, what readers of this text would get out of it. Like they would immediately get all of this. It would be obvious. Oh, Ari- Ariopagus, Stoa. That's where the Stoics are. Oh, that's what Aratus or, or Cleanthes said or whatever. Right. So like they would, they would get these, these illusions. Uh, and then the ones who actually know the scriptures, who, who study the scriptures, even Gentiles did study the scriptures. If you convert to a sect, uh, to a religion, just as Christians do today, uh, you will study the scriptures of the sect that you're in. You don't have to be Jewish to know the Old Testament. Uh, and so they'll do the same thing. They'll go in and they'll, they'll just see, oh, he's making allusions to the passage about all the nations that God put under angels. And like, so they'll get all of these things. They'll be, they'll be clear. And even when they're not clear, when a preacher, you know, like a bishop or a, a elder is reading this text to a congregation, he will tell them in a homily, he will explain all of these things to them. So, uh, so like, like, like you have to understand these things in context and, and Israel only just doesn't do context. They don't do context for verses. They don't do context for history. They don't do context for authors, literary structure. Uh, context, this isn't their game. Mm. Uh, and, and yet that's, that's crank methodology is when you ignore context, you're a crank. When you, when you attend to context, you're at least starting to pay attention to the way proper historical methodology works. And I want people to understand when you say context, you don't mean because he quotes Hosea, we need to have Hosea's context, the context of the author using the context for his own need and want. And that is what we need to look at that context, not right. So like the Hosea context could matter, 
if that's the way Paul uses the text. Like if Paul right. gives his exegesis of Hosea and it matches the original context of Hosea, then the context of Hosea matters because Paul brought it in. Uh, but that's not what Paul does. When he quotes Hosea, he quotes it in a, a detailed rhetorical argument where he's making the opposite argument. He's misusing Hosea on purpose. Uh, and so in, you can only know that if you pay attention to what Paul is doing with the verse. You can't just quote it out of context, right? You can't just assume that Paul means what Hosea means. You, you have to prove that Paul means what Hosea means, right? You need evidence. You can't just assert it. <laughs> well, there's a <laughs> and point. what IO does. They just make these assertions, present no evidence for them, and then act like they've proved their case. Uh, and that's, that's the methodology that's completely broken and cannot achieve uh, any rational conclusion. One of the a, a few verses, and we'll end this uh, in in this show because we're never going to cover everything, okay? No. And that's why well, I that's wanted to point, s- right? They write yeah, forty five yeah. page treatises with thousands of verses, you, and yeah. this is what they do. So, like, let me just say up front, Jason Acosta changed his mind somewhat. He's kind of uh, well. If my earlier interpretation was correct, I mean, but we'll, we'll, my good friend uh, Rob Shannon, you know, pointed us out and. I cussed at him and was really angry at him all day till I changed my mind and decided to do this updated video. But anyway, uh, the idea that um, let, let's just poke at that one for a second, because I could go to Romans nine and show there's a contrast between Gentile and Israel. But I was going to say, there's another part where he says that uh, if he did not leave us a remnant of the seed, well, look at his context in Romans nine through 11. He seems to be addressing the to Jew and Gentile in some respect here, because he's trying to explain why Gentiles are coming in at the well, same he, time. He says when he, he means seed, he means spiritually, not biologically. Like he has a whole section in Romans nine where he's like, he's really trying to argue this. Like he's clearly has to argue it. That's, that's also key evidence is that he has to argue this. This is like, no, no, no. Okay. So yes, he said seed, but that, that did not mean strictly biologically. It meant it includes the spiritual way of becoming the seed of Abraham. Like there's lots of verses in, in Romans, especially where Paul tries to strain this argument that like, no, no, it includes non-biological uh, inheritance. Seed is a metaphor for it's, you know, it's a, 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 um, an allegory for a broader goal of God. The fact that Paul has to argue that and that that is what Paul is arguing is how we know he's not arguing the IO thesis. He could have argued the IO thesis. He could have plainly said, oh yeah, d- these, these Gentiles are acceptable because they are actually descendants of Israel. Mm-hmm. So they're the acceptable ones. And yeah, there are some other Gentiles. Ha- That's the other weird thing is like, what, what, why are there no examples of Gentiles being turned away? Like, like saying like, well, I want to be saved too. Uh, I don't know. Can, can you prove that you're a descendant of a, an Israelite? You can't get in. <laughs> like Paul never has to deal with that argument. Like that right. never comes up, which is, shows that it wasn't a thing. <laughs> that was happening. Yeah. Uh, but Paul would have argued if, oh, Paul believed IO, he would have argued it. It would be clear. You wouldn't need to engage in all this weird legitimate and these, this trickery with verses to try and extract meaning from Paul that isn't there. Uh, he would have just freaking said it. And then you could just say, look, Paul said it. And then we go, yeah, you're right. Paul said that. That's, that's clearly what he believed. Um, there- so... That's yeah. the, it's just a methodology in, in general. You see them do this all over and over again. They do it over and over. Romans chapter one, the Gentiles here that are co- committing foreign or sexual deviancy, you know, doing wrong things, worshiping wood, hay and stubble idols, all these things. They go, well, that's Israel. Cause look, they could show an old Testament verse where it shows that Israel started falling for these things. And it's like, and this is what they do over and over. And I want to just yeah. start with the, what I brought up at the end, at the beginning with the end here. Initially, he thought that among the Gentiles and among the Samaritans were elect lost sheep of the house of Israel. So the initial interpretation this guy was saying was Jesus is saying, actually, guys, to the 12, go to those places, but only find these guys. And that's not at all what he's saying. He's in fact saying, avoid those places completely, only go to the Jew that's it. And they are the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So what does that do yeah. Yeah. logically, since this is their anchor text to argue in Matthew 10, Matthew 15, I came only for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Um, what that does is who are the lost sheep of the house of Israel? According to Matthew, they're not the Gentiles and they're not the Samaritans. However, Which, whereas the Samaritans of every, of anybody who could claim lost Israelite ancestry would be the freaking Samaritans. Right. And that's so anyway, what, but, I wanted to ask you this. You're absolutely 100% right because this is where it's like, uh, okay, my patience gets tested because it's like, okay, they jumped to John 
And I get it. Matthew, guys, he even admits on board on his recent video, like Jews are the lost sheep here in this, in this context. He sees the problem with this, though, on his whole non-contradictory harmonizing by running the Acts chapter one, Luke, John. Damn, they're in the cities of Samaritans preaching the gospel and converting Samaritans and Gentiles are starting to come in and stuff. So my question is, if they're not the lost sheep in Matthew, and he's going to them in Luke, and he's going to them in John, these guys go to a new rhetoric. Well, shoot, we can't let go of IO. So they run and they go, Jesus did say he had sheep not of this fold in John. Therefore, there's other sheep and only Israel were called sheep. And they do that kind of rhetoric. So yeah. I said, and I wanted your opinion, the prodigal son, for example, or the good Samaritan, like, why are they even saying these things? I think the rift between Jew and Samaritan potentially, and I'm not saying this is fact, it's an option that the idea of like the prodigal son very well could be a, a, a uniting of the Samaritan with the Jew and saying, guys, let's get over this thing. We're all brothers. Like this could be a rift, like connecting them and, and like stop the division between the two. Also, John, or Matthew's not, uh, Matthew's not cool with the Samaritans. He's obviously not cool with them and the Gentiles till the end of the gospel. Like, all right, now you can go for them. They're not really important, but now they are. Um, the John and Acts are saying, go to them. Luke's uniting something. He's trying yeah, to Luke, correct Matthew. Luke is, arguing, Luke is trying to get rid of Matthew's argument. He's trying to hide it, basically. He's, he lit, that's, that contradiction is on purpose. But Luke specifically creates a mission to the Greeks and the Samaritans specifically for the purpose of nullifying that verse in Matthew to, to sort of basically get rid of it, right? Because Luke is promoting the Gentile church, uh, whereas Matthew is against the Gentile church. So, so you're, you're looking at two documents that are arguing against each other to try and force a harmony between them as if they were written, like they, co they colluded together. Luke and Matthew colluded together to write coherent text is not what happened. Like they, did, they were not even in the, the same book originally. They were not even ever meant to be together. Uh, it was the later, you know, faux Christians that put them together. So, <laughs> and so like this, but again, we, we have evidence for this. I'm not just asserting this. You can go, there's tons of scholarship on it. We have tons of evidence that we can see the arguments and how they formed. We can see the arguments, even in uh, other Christian texts outside the Bible, we see this going on. Um, whereas the IO people will come in and just make these assertions and present no evidence for their version of how, why are we interpreting Luke in light of John? John argues against Luke. Like we shouldn't be trying to understand Luke by assuming that John is going to tell us what Luke actually meant. Luke would be deeply offended by us doing that. Uh, and so like <laughs> same, same with all these other things. Um, so, so yeah, that you're, you're, you're spot on in the way that they, <coughs> that they use the new Testament with the Pesher technique, just like the Christians did the old Testament, um, which is a bogus technique, uh, right? Like the only justification they had for it was that, that God exists and secretly manipulated the text. Like they're, they're the original QAnon uh, conspiracy theory, right? Like they have this idea uh, that God has inspired this perfect hidden message and only we are inspired by God to find that hidden message. Uh, and it was hidden there to prevent the devil from finding it and so on. Um, that, I mean, that's wackadoo. That's early Christianity was wackadoo. Like that, yeah. that, was, that was the case. Um, but to, to do that, like, and then not like make the, they're not even making the argument that God inspired all of this. And it's a, the secret messages that they are inspired by the Holy Spirit to correctly read the messages. They're not even doing that, which would be more Pentecostal, uh, I think, in a way. But um, no, they'd have more reason they're, they're to believe a, a secular methodology. Like, they're right. turning Pesher into a secular methodology, and that doesn't work. That doesn't, there's, if there's no, if God isn't inspiring all this stuff and isn't inspiring you to read the code, this is not a valid methodology. This is tea leaf reading. This is forcing the text to say what you want it to say rather than actually reading the text for what it meant to say, basically. And that's why good scholars like Dr. Goodacre, who I recently had on about Q about a month and a half, two months ago, three months ago, uh, he even points out this problem. Like he's an honest, you know, and I believe he is a Christian. And I respect the man. That's 100% his choice. The thing is, he's not lying or trying to right. cover up. It, it's almost like IO has to be extreme fundamentalist to the point that they're willing to say Matthew 10 means Acts 1-8. Now, he might be changing his mind, of course, now. Right, right, uh, yeah. But what implications that brings, I don't even think he sees what that does to the thesis. By him allowing Jews to be the lost sheep here, 
and that excludes Gentiles and the Samaritans, destroys that whole premise of him anchoring IO through these, these texts that they like to go hammer Christians 14 hours a day in chat rooms and harass people and then create fake accounts so they can go back in there and continue to harass people. It's like, come on, man. Right. What's yeah. your, what is your motivating which, factor? Which another thing, right? Like uh, if you're crazy, you, you cannot be wrong. So if people are refuting you, they're motivated to do these things, to sock puppet themselves, to harass people, they have to try the people they can't abide someone not seeing what they're seeing. Right. So like they're, they're forced to either persuade people or somehow slag them off as completely unreliable or they've been refuted or like basically exile and shun them or whatever. Those are their two strategies, harass or shun. Uh, and uh, you know, and that's, that's, that's crazy. That's not a rational scholarly way to behave. Mm. Um, that's not professionalist. Uh, it's, it's amateur and childish. Uh, and, but that's typical of people who have these kinds of delusional beliefs, um, which I is not the only group that does this is like, I mentioned the flat earthers is another uh, category of people who do the same thing, uh, but there's I, many. Of them, right? I'm not trying to poison the well, even though I know they don't believe that they think I'm not, they think I'm just absolutely anti them. But I talked to a lot of IOers that are friends of mine and I talked to them on the phone and they are very much into conspiracies. Like, a lot of them, most of them are conspiratorial. The case. Yeah, uh, they aggregate. So if you're, if you're prone to believe in conspiracy theories, you're going to aggregate conspiracy theories. So they, they do, they, there is a certain personality type that is very prone to believing these things. And don't get me wrong, I get it. There are real conspiracies in the world, but it's like, whew, now you're getting into la la land. So yeah. ladies it's and gentlemen. Uh, excessive pattern recognition, right? They're, they're seeing patterns everywhere that don't exist. Uh, their, their, their pattern recognition isn't dialed to a more attenuable level where they're like, but a lot of patterns are random and just they're accidentally there and you can't make them fit, uh, if you really look closely, but if you're really obsessed with seeing the pattern and can't let go of the pattern, even though there's now you find evidence against the pattern, there's a certain personality type that, that sticks you in that sort of faulty cognitive bias world basically and then once that happens then you're highly prone to believing these things uh and and you can tip way off the deep end uh, as a result of it um final thought ladies and gentlemen make sure you guys go down in the description like i said help dr carrier become a patron he does a lot of stuff like this and i'm gonna throw it out there you may not want me to but either way if you guys are interested in a project okay he will possibly potentially as long as it's not completely batshit crazy consider helping you in some way shape or form but it I'm does time is money yeah. <laughs> I'm his money, Dr. Carrier. And I don't care what anyone thinks, man. I don't go cut people's lawns because I enjoy it. I'll go cut your grass because I want to make money and I will do a good job and you pay me for what you want. I called you because I knew, you know, Greek, you're an expert when it comes to these things. You know how to source what you're doing. You're not going to just pull a rabbit out of your hat and say, well, here's what you wanted yeah. to hear, Derek. You told me in private that you're, you may not like my conclusions. I might come out on the other side and say, you're wrong. Um, they have a point. And instead, you've come out opposite. So these guys will use words like assembly. All right. In the Greek, they'll go and they'll use words like gather together and assembly. And they think that means like every context is something sounds similar. It means election or it means the elect or the, you know, like they have this uh, way of interpreting things that uh, my good friend Stephen was looking and he was trying to find it last night before we did the show to like, there is a point where they quote something that doesn't give that kind of implication. It's almost like calling you out of your house to go to an assembly. That's it. They, they make it mean this predestinarian election for the Israelites and stuff. And it's like, at what point do you stop? They just quoted another man who said, all Israelites are Gentiles. When we looked up the guy, he has no sources, number one. He was an ex-fundamentalist preacher in South Africa who got kicked out of his own cult, number two. And number three, he learned this two weeks before he posted this article. So I said, oh my God, they're willing to retort to that. And they used a fake account when they published it. And I think it was a guy named Michael Bieris uh, uh -huh. who published it under another fake account. So <laughs> they're willing to go and find anything they can to just assert their position. Yeah. And yeah. there you go. <laughs>
<laughs> yeah, people who want to I give examples of all the things you're talking about. I give examples of that kind of stuff, the the hack linguism, the the desperate finding of any article that like maybe sounds like their view and so on. Um, that's all in my article. So uh, the incompetent crankery of uh, the Israel only movement, you can find it on my blog, which, you know, you'll see the link below, but it's richardcarrier.info, richardcarrier.info. All my things are there. You can find uh, in the uh, categories menu, you can find my classes. I teach classes in biblical, uh, biblical studies, philosophy, ancient history. I teach all kinds of courses. Uh, you can check those out on my website. Uh, you can find my Twitter feed and my, tw my uh, Facebook feed there, uh, my blog and my Patreon if you want to help support me. Um, and if you want to buy my books or even find recommendations, I have recommendations. There's a link there for recommendations in Origins of Christianity, Philosophy, Ancient Science, uh, which are my all three of my specialties. So uh, all my stuff you can find at richardcarrier.info. Uh, so check that out. Uh, and yeah, if you want to hire me do, to do stuff, uh, I am a bit pricey. So yeah. uh, it depends on what you want me to do. But, um, but we can talk about it. Just uh, email me uh, a business proposal. I do appreciate it, man. And um, ladies and gentlemen, make sure you guys go down, check it out. Help Dr. Carey out. We're going to have more on Myth Vision. Of course, not talking about these subjects anymore. I had to put this out there, guys. This has been oh, something, yeah. gotcha. you know, <laughs> but, I, but I have to say, Dr. Carrier, I want you to come back. Let's talk about science in the ancient world, the yeah. Roman. Like, I'm interested in stuff that isn't just Jesus related necessarily. Yeah. Like, I want to know what ancient... Um, how the ancient philosophies worked. Like I want to learn all yeah. that stuff. So I probably am going to take you up on some of these courses soon myself. And ladies and gentlemen, go drop a shekel in there. Give him a PayPal even for this episode, like help him for his time. I do appreciate it, man. Cause this is how you make your living is uh, educating man. And, and thank you so yeah, much. I, I work as an independent scholar. I have, I am my own boss. It's nice. Uh, I don't make six figures, but uh you know, I'm not wealthy, but, uh, but I make a living and I enjoy doing it and I'm not beholden to anyone. That's uh, awesome. So it, it is nice. So, I, but, but yeah, it does mean that I, unlike professors who just get a salary, I do depend on people supporting me. So, uh, patrons who support my work, make it possible for others to, cause I, my blog is free, so it's available to everybody. So these articles are things that if you help fund them, you know, if you're as a Patreon supporter and stuff, you're helping making these blog articles available to the wider public, to the world. Actually, there's people all over the world read them, uh, including people behind the curtain in Islamic countries, uh, I, as I know for a fact, uh, also read my stuff. Uh, so it has that influence, but also you get to quote and cite them because you, you get these, you know, like for you in this case, you actually funded the research on this, but uh, you and your fans uh, helped fund it. Uh, but now that article exists, you can, you, can, you've got, you can bookmark it and every time it comes up, you're gonna say, go read this, you know, go read this. So once you have that, you actually have a tool that you can use to help you and your audience better uh, respond to these things, better react to these things, better handle these things and so on. Uh, so the work is useful to people. And if you believe in making that more widely available for, for yourself and for the world, uh, yeah, become a Patreon supporter or a regular PayPal supporter and so on. And all of that stuff you can find uh, options on my website. Which also are down in the description to get to the website. Make sure you guys do brand new book, get the book. Don't leave me hanging, guys. I appreciate you guys being Myth Vision fans, watching me and Dr. Carrier discuss this theory. And we will be seeing you soon because he's going to be debating today Dr. Dennis R. McDonald on the existence of Jesus historically. Was he a mythologized man or was he a revelatory angelic being, so to speak, or a godly angelic being who is now historicized or you hemorized, if you will. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Carey. I appreciate it, man. Yeah. Glad to be here. Thanks for having yes, me. Sir. Yeah. Thank you. And don't forget everybody, in case you have cognitive dissonance, like some people that we're doing the show about, we are Myth Vision. <laughs>